don't worry it's now you, you got disconnected just when you were about to start so you haven't basically started anything yet uh, okay alhamdulillah okay all right so Tafatul, right. you have the floor okay then so inshallah <clears throat> so we said uh, briefly that um the last lecture the last two lectures focus on the prophet as the as the educator par excellence and then finally we dealt briefly with the uh, institutions of learning in islam including the the birth and the development of the madrasa so today inshallah we're going to deal with uh, we're going to read the author's preface from professor atas's concept of education in islam inshallah with some elaboration uh, in uh, in the coming weeks we wherein we will have about two more lectures we will deal one with western education dominant educational theories in the west and then finally the the special topic inshallah bismillahirrahmanirrahim author's note the present book is a commentary of what is contained in pages 4 to 7 9 to 12 and 14 to 20 of my paper entitled preliminary thoughts on the nature of, of knowledge and the definition and aims of education presented at the first world conference on muslim education held at makkah from march 31st to april 8 in 1977 since this book is an elaboration which seeks to clarify the subject of the paper cited above and it's naturally connected in logical sequence with the ideas conve conveyed therein as a development of its basic concepts the substance of this book was appropriately presented as a paper to the Second World Conference on Muslim Education held at Islamabad from March 15 to March 20 this year. It is basically a book of definitions relating to the essential elements in the concept of education and the educational process as envisaged in Islam. In the concluding remarks of the paper cited above, I stated on page 21 that the essential elements of the Islamic system of education are based on certain key concepts, namely the concept of religion, yani deen, the concept of man as insan, the concept of knowledge encompassing both ilm and ma'rifa, the concept of wisdom, yani al hikmah the concept of justice, al-adl, the concept of right action, amal as adab, and the concept of the university, the kuliyah jami'ah. Here in this book, I treat these concepts again, dispensing with the need for further clarification on those that were already clarified in the paper. The definitions demonstrate the interrelated nature of the concepts. The concept of adab as right action or discipline is here elaborated. New definitions are added, such as those of the intellect, al-aqal, and what constitutes rationality, al-nutuq, of Islamization of language and of thought, of meaning, ma'ana, knowledge and education, ta'deeb. These definitions are based on personal reflection and conceptual analysis viewed in the context of the Islamic intellectual and religious tradition, with the exception, perhaps, of the concept of justice. The definitions are original, and to the best of my knowledge, they are also new, born as they are, out of the present need for creative thinking and clarification of the basic concepts pertaining to knowledge and education. Moreover, the formulation of these concepts and the way they are brought together in meaningful pattern, both in the paper and in this book, are perhaps the first formulation and conceptualization of its kind found in the context of Muslim intellectual and religious thinking of our times. Already in the paper, I have put forward some new ideas 
the idea that the purpose of seeking knowledge and of education in Islam is to produce a good man and not a good citizen. The meaning of the concept good in the definition of good man, the concept of the Islamic university as reflecting man, i.e. the universal or perfect man and not the state, which is not to be confused with what many Muslims today think of as an Islamic university, in quote, unquote, Marx. Now in this little book, I present some other new ideas. First, the concept of methodology of scientific research and study of nature along the lines of Quranic interpretation, tafsir and ta'win. The concept of Islamic language, the role of the Holy Quran in the Islamization of the languages of Muslim peoples, including the Arabic language. Finally, the education and the educational process in the Islamic sense is in reality defined by the concept of ta'deeb and not by that of tarbiyah. I make no apology for making claims to originality in the conception of new ideas and definitions as specified and formulated herein and in my earlier writings because the necessity for such claims has now arisen. I refer here to the regrettable instances in which certain Muslim scholars of Islam and scholars and intellectuals amongst the Muslims have appropriated some of these ideas in their writings without due acknowledgement after they had become acquainted with them in lectures, conferences, meetings, and private discussions. The purpose of acknowledging the source of an important idea is, apart from the moral obligation to do so, to point those who pursue the subject for the sake of the community to the right direction, so that they might not be misled concerning the value and validity of that idea and its further development and clarification along logical lines, which only the original source is justly capable of doing. But if Muslim writers, whether in English, Arabic, or other languages, are in the habit of either pointing to themselves or to others in respect of significant ideas not really originated by them, then they obliterate thereby the real source and deprive the community of knowledge of the right direction. The ideas discussed under each subheading in the book can indeed be expanded in further elaboration, and their soundness can be tested and evaluated in accordance with their suitableness to the requirements of the truth as a firm on the testimony of Islamic sources and reflected in the Islamic intellectual and religious tradition. But the aim of this book is only to provide the necessary framework within which the Islamic philosophy of education can be formulated and conceptualized. Said Muhammad Naqib al Atas, Talingaya, 16th of Jumada al Akhirah, the year 1400, which corresponds with the first May of 1980. So, what we have discussed <clears throat> or what we have read briefly, is Professor Balatas's uh, introduction or note to this very terse uh, and compact treatise, which provides for a framework for an Islamic philosophy of education. Already there, in the first pa paragraph, he explained um, that the, the present book yes, comments and expands and elaborates upon a paper that he has delivered during uh, the first world conference on Muslim education held at Makkah yes, uh, in 1977, which he certainly had a, a very important role um, in uh, towards its organization. Because as we know, as uh, as uh, written and and reported, let us say, by Professor Wan Muhammad Noor in the educational philosophy and practice with sources of Sayyid Muhammad Naqib al -Atas. Professor Wan mentions there that um, before the, the conference took place, Professor Atas had written letters to the secretary of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Countries, in response to a questionnaire uh, regarding the major problems besetting the Muslim, uh, Muslim nations, fresh out of independence. And there, Professor Atas um, already set out uh, to, to explain that the, the, the major problems <laughs> Uh, derives from the problematic area of education, which is the, uh, and more to be more precise, the content of education. This is because what was current back then, say in the second half of the 20th century, was the, the, the ideas of modernization that swept through the Muslim nations. And the Muslim nations um, being fitted, let us say, within the modern ideas of uh, development, like in uh, Gunnar Merdal's idea the, uh, of the, 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 the development of, of, let us say, third world countries, understood themselves to be backward under such, um, uh, let us say, uh, indicators such as uh, economic backwardness, uh, technological backwardness, lack of scientific 
practice and knowledge and uh, some of them um, identified the problem to be societal cultural and some even go as far as to say that it is derived from the uh, the religious background yes uh, professor atas then was uh, was the one who have said that uh, rather the the problem is in education yeah, and, and to be more precise the content of education which does not uh, properly fulfill the aims and purposes of education so therefore when this uh, when this um, conference on muslim education held at makkah yes which was attended by 313 scholars from all around the muslim world professor atas then presented uh, this this paper with the title of uh, preliminary thoughts on the nature of knowledge and the definition and aims of education it uh, then there was a follow up to that conference the second one in islamabad uh, in the, um, which is what, which was then held in 1980 so what then is this book yes um, of course those who have uh, perhaps been more familiarized with the islamic intellectual tradition as well as um, uh, traditions of knowledge that rely a lot on text and, and uh, the commentary tradition will understand the significance of a book of definitions, which sometimes um, correspond with what we may call book of uh, mutun, basic texts. In other words, this will, will have um, definition of key terms um, relating to uh, certain important concepts, let us say within a, a subject matter, within the discipline of knowledge. We have uh, uh, we have such uh, such cases like in the in the book of Ta'rifat of Imam Al Jurjani, in which uh, he gathers together the definitions of several key terms uh, spanning various um, uh, various subject matter. It is in a single volume, which is not uh, not too big in, in that sense, but uh, it contains um, key terms uh, such as the, the akal, ilim, and various other uh, significant um, terminologies and definitions wherein he also would give the the definition as per let us say its usage amongst the grammarians as per its usage amongst the fuqaha or the the jurist consults and so on now uh, professor atas is then writing again a, a book of definitions yes relating to the essential elements of the in the concept of education and the educational processes envisaged in islam why is it important then to go back to the definitions? Uh, I believe there is a, a Western philosopher by the name of Ayn Rand who said that uh, definitions are the guardians of rationality. Yes, the definitions are the guardians of rationality. In other words, when we define things properly, um, then our rationality has, uh, has a means of an anchoring their thought within, let us say, a constellation of meanings. Um, <clears throat> And uh, education and the educational process is certainly a key concept within any civilization because education is a means through which the essential concepts of one generation get passed on, pass on to the next generation. How do you maintain your identity? Yes, uh, identity is preserved primarily through education and the educational process. So therefore, uh, what is to be the content of education? Its process, uh, which includes pedagogy and the role of the teacher, and the significance of the teacher and the student, uh, understanding who the student is, yes, and what education involves. These are certainly uh, important uh, key terms, yes, in the, in, in the pre towards the preservation of cultures and civilizations. In the concluding remarks of the paper, uh, Professor Atas mentioned that what is the essential, what are the essential elements of the Islamic system of education, yes, and this, of course, in the general sense, uh, we know that the Islamic intellectual tradition was fostered and developed within the larger civilization of Islam and has been preserved for centuries. Uh, in fact, more than a thousand years from the time of the Prophet wasallam, and Prophet Atas ventured several key concepts that are universal throughout the civilization. And these concepts are especially the ones that are being challenged by the modern day western system of education and we know in in, in recent history uh, the the modern system the modern secularized western system of education is able to be permeated in muslim countries partially as a result of um, uh, globalization and previous to that uh, colonization and also the introduction of western uh, modes of thinking uh, via these educational systems including of course 
the media and its 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 various uh, other institutions, which includes, of course, before such um, alternative uh, um, socializing um, enterprises were introduced into the Muslim nations, it entailed first and foremost the cutting of the Muslims from their roots. Yes, the cutting of the Muslims from their own uh, source uh, of, of education. And this included, of course, what was termed by uh, Professor Wa'il Hallad in his book on Taha Abdul Rahman, what is called a structural genocide. A structural genocide is not necessarily a genocide involving the lives of people, but it need not necessarily be any less fatal. The structural genocide with regards to the Muslim nations involves, first and foremost, the eviscerating of the, the system of the awqaf, which is essential, yes, the system of the awqaf uh, uh, funds the madaris, funds the madrasa, which is the center, uh, the central institution that um, socializes the next generation into the Islamic intellectual tradition. And uh, the awqaf would also uh, run masajid, which is another important center for learning. And uh, the awqaf is also the, uh, responsible for the uh, for the maintenance of the independence of the scholars and scholarship. And so therefore, with structural genocide involving the economic uh, institutions, including the awqaf, but also um, fair trade in the marketplaces and various other aspects, um, gradually you see that um, the, 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 the funds or the, the education being more and more channeled towards the modern uh, secularized system whereby education is a means to promote, let us say, um, upward social mobility, one of them, uh, but primarily to be a good citizen in the sense of being able to serve the interests of the modern state. What then are the key concepts that we ought to convey? Yes, what are the key concepts that is meant to be part and parcel of the educational content? What should a Muslim educate the next generation in the, in the most fundamental sense? So according to Prof. Atas, first and foremost, uh, it has to be the concept of deen, yani religion, because it is the most fundamental uh, concept that encompasses beliefs, practices, and ethics. Yes, Islam, Iman, wa Ihsan. In the, um, in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, which is um, um, commonly referred to as the hadith Jibril, Yes, uh, Sayyidina Jibril, uh, after leaving the Prophet in the, uh, in the hadith, the Prophet wasallam then asked the companions, do you know who that was? And then they answered that uh, the, the Prophet, uh, Allah and his Prophet uh, are more knowledgeable. Wallahu Rasulu A'lam. Then he, he then said, that was Jibril who came to teach you your deen. So therefore, deen encompasses all these three, uh, including, of course, the, the signs of the end of times. But deen is also the fundamental, uh, the uh, one fundamental function, yes, of the human existence. Followed, uh, uh, what follows from deen, which is the let us say the umbrella concept uh, uh, under which are several key concepts, is the concept of man al insan, and then the concept of knowledge as al alim and ma'rifa, and then the concept of wisdom as al hikmah, and then the concept of justice, and then the concept of amal as adab. And then the kuliah jamia. Why has he selected these uh, key concepts as part of the educational process? Because we will see that these are the fundamental concepts which are being challenged by the modern Western educational system. Uh, with its uh, <clears throat> whereas the name, whereas the name of the concepts will be the same, but its content will be dissimilar. Will be not the same. Meaning to say, in the West, uh, religion has has suffered secularization. And by extension, man too has, has, has suffered secularization. Man has been reduced to his um, animalistic aspect, physical, biological aspect, together with this vague term, uh, which is called mind, uh, uh, removing of himself the element of soul or spirit, ruh, khalb, and so on. And the concept of man, of course, is also now fitted within the, the evolutionary concept of the, uh, of, of the naturalists, which is uh, devi uh, devoid of uh, spiritual content. Thirdly, once religion is secularized, and by extension man being reduced to his biological, psychological component, knowledge, therefore, is not al-ilm. 
Yes, knowledge is is no longer an ilm. Uh, whereas in in the Islamic intellectual tradition, the notion of ilm and ma'rifa is one concept which has been jealously guarded generation after generation. Al ilm requires adab in in its acquisition. Al ilm uh, possesses the character of justified true belief. Yes, a belief which is justified and warranted. In other words, uh, ilm cannot be mixed together with uh, dhan, which is uh, conjecture. But modern knowledge contains elements of that. Because mo modern knowledge, which is taught in the universities and, uh, and spread in the, in the public spaces, may contain elements of Western philosophy, yes, which, is not, uh, which is not properly within the, within the ambit of knowledge. Yes, so therefore, when the, the, the central concept, let us say, ilm, uh, which is knowledge, becomes compromised, then what you teach as knowledge may not be properly knowledge because now it is, uh, it is mixed between that which is true and that which is false. That which is the element uh, that derives from, let us say, empirical observation, rational uh, calculation, but also yes, philosophic and cultural inheritance, which are not, which are, which are not uh, ascertained properly, which are, which are ultimately just a, 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 that which is held as a creed which cannot be proven. In other words, these are base assumptions, yes, which we can challenge, and we do challenge because we, we possess an alternative uh, source of the, uh, the realities of things, which is the Quran. Then what follows from that is the concept of wisdom as al-hikmah. And hikmah, as we know, is, uh, is interconnected with the knowledge which is, uh, which is inherited from the prophets. The term hikmah, as we know, uh, denotes yes, um, uh, a kind of action which corresponds with, uh, with, uh, with knowing the limits of things, which corresponds with acting rightly. And certainly it uh, assumes intelligence and it also assumes divine guidance. Yes, wisdom is the property lit from the lantern of prophecy. Then there is the notion of justice, al-adal. Yes, the notion of justice in Islam, as it differs from that of the West, and this Professor Attas would, would then elaborate in a later book called uh, On Justice and the Nature of Man. Uh, in the West, the, the two dominant conceptions of justice uh, is the concept of justice, which is um, politically derived, and then secondly, naturally derived. Nevertheless, political justice, which has become the dominant concept of justice, restricts itself first and foremost, solely to the realm between man and another person. Uh, and it is always in a, in, a, uh, in a relationship of one person to another party, either man and, uh, and his uh, companion, man and the state, yes, uh, man and his community, and so on. Uh, the concept of justice does not involve, in the West at least, since the times of Aristotle, of justice to oneself. But in the Islamic intellectual tradition, in the worldview of Islam, the concept of justice, al-adal, derives from one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it permeates the entire realm of existence. And justice is understood as the condition of things being in their proper places. And the proper places of things would be known as a result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, education of man. Nah. The concept of right action, yes, the concept of right action, yes, uh, which encompasses amal as adab, yes, and adab, as we said just now, flows from hikmah, yes, adab flows from hikmah, which he will then uh, elaborate further in this book as we read. And then finally, when all these concepts come together as part and parcel of the Islamic philosophy of education, as part and parcel of the, the business of what we are doing when we're doing Islamic education, uh, these are all taught, yes, where institutions are concerned within the university, which is understood as the kulliya. And here, Professor Attas gives an original, uh, original exposition of the meaning of kulliya as a place in which al-insan al-kulli yes, is produced. Al-insan al-kulli. And who is the insan al-kulli? Al-insan al-kulli or the universal man is a person who is being endowed with universal knowledge, yes. Uh, like the scholars of the Islamic intellectual tradition who are known as being authoritative, yes, authoritative in several disciplines uh, and at the same time knowledgeable 
in the in the various sciences. Now, the kulia, yes, uh, is also understood as the kulia because it derives from the universal man whose uh, the, the original model was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whose knowledge uh, is uh, wahbi, meaning to say it's given by Allah subhanahu wa taala, and it encompasses the worlds, uh, this world and the realms beyond. And the knowledge which is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unto the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam derives from taqwa, derives from religious practice, yes, and acknowledges, acknowledges the ultimate source of knowledge being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although there are portions of knowledge which is arrived at through observation in this world, there are portions of knowledge that, uh, that one arrives at through rational analysis. There are portions of knowledge that one arrives at through travels. And the Quran, as we, we mentioned earlier, acknowledges these sources. Yes, uh, the knowledge derived from history, knowledge derived from nature, as well as uh, knowledge derived from, uh, uh, from within oneself, psychological knowledge, which is arrived at through introspection. Now, these three uh, sub-disciplines uh, of knowledge, which uh, owes its origin in the Quran, are largely iktisabi in nature. Meaning to say they are acquired knowledge. Yes, they are acquired through man's efforts, study, analysis. And uh, an authoritative person in these three fields is a person who is, um, whose authority is based on his uh, acquisition in that sense. But knowledge which is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now that, uh, that is dependent solely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's absolute freedom to bestow upon mankind. So already now, if if you look at the, the 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 introduction and our our brief discussion here, <clears throat> that we are largely describing, uh, perhaps for, for those of us who may not uh, have been uh, familiar with these concepts or who have not been thinking along these concepts, we wouldn't we wouldn't realize, for example, that there are subtle differences. Uh, or important differences between what we consider today as knowledge, then al-hilim, wisdom, and hikmah, and so on and so forth. So here in this book, I treat these concepts again, disp dispensing with the need for further clarification on those that were already clarified in the paper. In that paper, Professor Atas has dealt uh, in, in some, some detail with regards to the concept of deen, yes, and that has been expanded. Uh, to be the the single uh, to be a chapter in the prolegomena as well as Islam, Islam and secularism under the title concept of religion and the foundation of ethics and morality. Yeah, so uh, certainly uh, that that text is uh, is an important text uh, to be taught at universities, uh, to be taught at um, at higher institutions of learning, because it contains his reflection on a general expression of what the deen consists. To be sure, of course. When we look at the Islamic intellectual tradition, elements of the deen have been commented, elaborated upon by the great scholars. As we know, um, uh, there are scholars who have um, devoted uh, their research and erudition in expounding on the nature of Iman, which becomes the subject matter of Tawheed or Aqidah. There are those who have um, elaborated on the conception of, conception of uh, Islam as submission in the external sense, and this becomes the, the science of figure with its, with its various components. And then there are those who devoted their attention on the science of uh, tasawuf or al-ihsan, which involves, uh, let us say, um, uh, purification of the soul, yes, as well as the, uh, as the building of, of good character. Uh, but here, Professor Atas, but few do we find uh, scholars who try to, to, ex, to, to expound and combine these three elements together within a, um, within a short treatise that uh, will allow us to understand significantly what this, this uh, concept Dean is about. And Professor Atas, um, with his original thinking, uh, does a semantic analysis of the concept of the term Dean, yes, based on authoritative dictionaries, such as that of the Lisanul Arab of Ibn Mandur, and he connected, yes, connected the, the, the semantic content of the term deen with the verse of uh, the covenant, yes, verse um, uh, from, from Surah Al-A'raf that talks about man's covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the basis of religion. And he connects with, with in, that, in that text ideas such as knowledge, 
uh, ethics and the the notion of the generation gap and so on but nevertheless since he, since he said that he has done that in that work in this book he will focus on several other definitions first and foremost yes the definitions demonstrate an interrelated nature of the concepts the concept of adapt as right action or discipline is here elaborated new definitions are added such as those of the intellect allahu akbar al aqal and what constitutes rationality and nutuq now as we said uh, uh, earlier that professor atas um, is an architectonic thinker an architectonic thinker is a is a thinker who thinks within a framework of ideas in which one idea is interrelated with other ideas within the system and such that uh, the clarification of one leads to an understanding of the other aspects of the uh, of the of the system and the the, the architectonic uh nature of the islamic intellectual tradition uh, supports this because it derives from the quran ultimately which is the speech of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created the universe and mankind so when professor atas now wishes to promote the notion of adab as right action and discipline we must not be confused in our minds because we have perhaps been habituated i mean those of us who are brought up in muslim lands and muslim households we have this under the tendency to understand adab as uh, etiquette yes adab as etiquette there's etiquette with teachers there's etiquette with parents there's etiquette pertaining to eating uh, there's etiquette pertaining to proper decorum in the majlis and so on and so forth now these are to be sure these are all true but adab is not to be restricted to it so professor atas ventures yes, with the Uh, ventures to to bring us to an adventure of the intellect with his courage to develop this notion of adab uh, and properly so because this word is a is a key term as observed in the uh, hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam otherwise his blessed tongue uh, which has been uh, characterized as jawami al kalimi meaning to say uh, 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 words which he utters are so packed and full of wisdom such that he he needs only to utter few words but the, the wisdom derived therein is is um, elaborate it is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who said adabani rabbi fa ahsana ta'libi uh, my lord has educated me and what an excellent education that i have received certainly uh, the education that a human being like the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being of the highest station of humanity uh, as well as the entirety of creation the education that he received from his lord certainly is not restricted to just etiquettes in the in the in the in the manzil in the house uh, etiquettes with friendship but it would encompass the entirety of existence we know that in this blessed month of rajab that that we are now in that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been taken on the night journey uh, from his birthplace uh, makkatul mukarrama uh, to um, the masjid al aqsa and he there prayed together with the entirety of the prophets and he was then taken to ascend the heavens and then to to speak with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such incredible adab must must be possessed within him yes he must have been endowed with such an incredible adab for him to be able to deal with the best of humanity for him to be to be able to 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 address and to be addressed by the greatest prophets that has ever lived uh, upon the face of the earth for him to 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 keep the acquaintance of uh, the ark in uh, the ark angel jibril alayhi salam for him to pass through the various stations including the sidratul muntaha as the the end of the lot tree and for him to communicate with his lord certainly he would be when when he was educated by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he would be taught he would be taught the right and proper places of things including the relative values of the earth uh, the, the dunya and the akhirah the ephemeral uh, reality of this realm compared to the the vicissitudes of the hereafter and these are all parts of of adab so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the manba it, he is the source he is the 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 source of adab and certainly we ought to expand this and and this is what uh, what precisely professor atas has done in this work yes to meet the challenges of our time and the great challenge that we 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 face in our time is none other than the colossal uh, or what we call the mass loss of adab yes that is that, that is initiated by the corruption of knowledge that attended the secularization process 
and we know that the loss of adapt that that humanity has suffered today includes loss of adapt towards nature uh, and the climate that uh, the climate crisis that results from it loss of adapt towards uh, things of value which results in the economic crisis or the values of things loss of adapt in the marketplace loss of adapt in um, uh, in the science that's various uh, various so certainly dealing with the the, the, the notion of the loss of adapt and the uh, and the restoration of of knowledge yes is a, is a major undertaking in our time to such an extent that this concept adapt ought to and this is what professor atas had done ought to to uh, be allowed to develop to its full potentiality and as we know that the nature of the arabic language supports the growth of words and the growth of meanings of words as we have seen in the in the in the rich tradition of tafsir and ta'wil as we know several words may acquire deeper meanings upon man's realization let us say uh, since man's experience uh, corresponds to this realm and the realm of the akhirah there are what there, there are sometimes one word yes which refers to a reality in this world and then refers to a reality in the akhirah and both uh, both are true descriptions but the experience will tell the difference uh, to to understand that uh, imam al ghazali gives uh, as an example in the kitab uh, at tauba of the ihya ulumuddin about the the difference between the 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 the, the realm that we we perceive or we inhabit during our state of having a dream or in our sleep uh, sleeping state and our wakeful state sometimes uh, in uh, when we are asleep we are shown um, let us say images we are shown sense images of which uh, the interpretation of such dreams will uh, will rely on our ability to decode yes the decode what the images represent imam al ghazali gives the example there that um, a person who in his dreams sees that he is uh, um, basically sealing uh, the, the mouths of people and uh, also uh, as people's private parts and so on and uh, and then it is said that when 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 he, he is awakened the person who interprets it say that uh, you are the muadhin basically because it is your and when you call when you call the sound of the adhan then uh, then the fast has has to be resumed so in other words yes so the, when we say ta'dib is is the proper candidate of a term yes uh, for for the prop the, the 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 process that is called education we mean by it that deep in its um that deep in the sense of its potentials being liberated to be able to describe properly yes the process of things being in their or the recognition and acknowledgement of things being in their proper places how does professor atas arrives at these things the methodology is now stated these definitions yes and and as we know the the uh, uh putting forth definitions is a powerful intellectual act yes in the islamic intellectual tradition the scholars said that um the act of putting definitions of things uh either in this rasmi sense which is to be descriptive of something uh which uh, true to say something true about the thing without limiting it to that thing precisely uh or it is the tahdidi sense yes in which Uh, it contains what is called the jami' wal mani' the two elements whereby everything that belongs within the concept is captured and what does not belong to it is excluded yes uh, like when we would let us say uh, this action of defining what a chair is yes the chair is um, let us say uh, an object designed for the human seated form yes now it is wide enough to cover all sorts of chairs all colors of chairs all variations of chairs and so it's it's wide enough to do that but it is also restrictive enough to exclude uh, tables and beds yes uh, now the act of definition with regards to something concrete like a chair is rather simpler compared to trying to define uh, more abstract notions such as education knowledge intellect and so on this requires a very powerful intellect to be able to do that I meaning to say to deal with the maqulat as opposed to the mahsusat dealing with sensibilia to define 
is easier than dealing with the intelligibilia. And even with sensibilia, we look at it is it is the most magnificent of minds in history that has done uh, excellent work in, in definitions. We know that um, in more recent times, uh, the, the labor of, of, of definition has been really fruitful with regards to marine biology and the biological realm more generally, to be able to describe and define what a species is, uh, to, to include uh, things within, let us say, genera, the level of, uh, let us say, specific difference and so on and so forth. This is a powerful mental act and part of the study of mantic, yes, part of the study of logic has as its purpose precisely to do that. Yes, and as we see the, 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 the magnificent development of the Islamic intellectual tradition, scholars have been, uh, have been gradually educated in this, in this uh, science as they study all the disciplines because all the disciplines of knowledge in Islam uh, in the traditional sense would always begin with what is called the mabadi, yes, the 10 principles of learning, which would include the tahdid, which would include the definition. All right. So now Professor Atta said that it is, um, uh, it is based on personal reflection. And what, uh, what kind of a reflection is this? As, the, uh, as Imam al-Ghazali quotes from a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, who said that um, a, a moment's reflection, yes, a moment's reflection is worth, um, Imam al-Ghazali gives various quantities, yes, various quantities, one of which, if I'm not mistaken, includes maybe 70 years yes, of prayer. Is that right? Fakusa'atan is equivalent to 70 years. And then there are other narrations of, of various uh, quantities. You know this? It's <laughs> uh, so reflection. And then conceptual analysis viewed in the context of the Islamic, intellectual, and religious tradition. Certainly here is, is, is important. Yes, there is room for personal reflection and conceptual analysis. But uh, any Muslim thinker, yes, any Muslim thinker, who is said to belong to the intellectual tradition, who is said to possess sanat in the sense that, that his, his knowledge is authoritative, uh, that it is safe to take from, must do his original individual reflection and conceptual analysis within the context of the intellectual and religious tradition. Because otherwise, if you're not doing it within the intellectual and religious tradition, as per some of the modernists today, you run the you run the risk of exacting violence upon the tradition, because you would know uh, yes if you're not steeped in the tradition that perhaps some of these ideas that you think are um, is natural to you uh, is something that you have read into the into the text like into the Quran, you have read into the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam owing to your 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 worldview being shaped by the westernized secularized worldview. When Professor Attas proposes, on the other hand, the central concepts, he does so, as it is said here, within the context of the Islamic intellectual and religious tradition. And he's not, he's not just claiming something without substantiating it. We would know that by the time that he proposed uh, the concept of education in Islam, here it, it is in the 1980 edition, but he wrote these ideas in the 70s. He has already established himself as a as a scholar of the Islamic intellectual tradition, he has already published his, uh, uh, his thesis on, on Hamza Fansuri and his postdoctoral work on, uh, on Nuruddin Arraniri. And in these two great works that he has published, he has, employed, uh, he has employed the analysis and the study of the great works in Tasawuf, in Ilmul Kalam, in, uh, in Falsafah Islamiyah or Al Hikmah. He has also studied um, quite uh, quite intensely uh, the books of tafsir and quite intensely also the books of definition in Islam. And so that is why, and remember that by the time that uh, he wrote this, and this was a publication of ISTEC in 1980, he's, already, oh, he's also had, a, had the, 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 year, the benefit of the years working with, uh, with great uh, scholarly minds uh, in, the, in the 20th century, discussing with them. Um, and uh, and reading from from these great books that he has assembled in the various libraries that he has assembled in in his lifetime, including but not limited to the library of of Istek. So Alhamdulillah, and we, we are we're very fortunate uh, to 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 be reading the books of of, of such a great thinker, uh, given given access in in the same way as I suppose um, in the past, some people are very thankful to have read. 
the writings of Ibn Sina because some of the the works that Ibn Sina produced were the result of um, were the result of deep studies of of books in libraries which have been raised to fire, which whose books have been destroyed, and only he has had access only and and his access to to those books is coupled with his uh, precocious intellect, coupled with his excellent education, coupled with uh, with his analysis and living with the community of scholars. So. Uh, so therefore, what what we receive by 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 that uh, virtue, yes, is is an excellent product of an inestimable worth. And the same in this case when Professor Atas uh, uh, promotes this this these new definitions. Now the definitions are original, and to the best of my knowledge, they are also new. And certainly, as as he has now proposed these definitions within the Islamic intellectual and religious tradition, it's being new and it's being original is not of the nature of what we may we might call a reprehensible innovation yes a reprehensible innovation is an innovation which does not belong to the tradition a reprehensible innovation is an innovation in which there is no principles yes that the earlier generation have uh, have established in their actions in their knowledge that you can derive from that would not run contrary to the spirit of the religion so uh, when professor atas proposes these things to be new it is contained let us say already in the tradition but perhaps in what we may call germinal forms in germinal forms now mm, yes and why are they born they are born out of the present need for creative thinking and clarification of the basic concepts pertaining to knowledge and education. We can give an analogous example in the science of uh, Aqidah, in the science of Aqidah. Whereas we know that uh, it was not necessary for the Sahaba to state, for example, in their creedal formulation, if, if ever they formulated their, their creedal beliefs, or the Tabi'in to say that God is not a substance. Yes, God is not a substance. God is not an atom. God is not a body. God is not a, a composite. Now these things probably is new, but uh, it is already contained when when uh, in the in when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said that laisa kamitlihi shayun that there is nothing in existence that is akin to him, uh, that is his equal, that is the same thing as he is. Um, uh, but when say Abu Hafs uh, an Nasafi in the line of the Maturidiyah say that he is not a substance, that is because uh, now the Islamic intellectual tradition have begun to contend with the physical theories of the universe, deriving from their contact with uh, the Greek uh, Hellenistic tradition. So there was then at that time a need for uh, a need for creative thinking and clarification of the basic concepts pertaining to the physical theories such that deriving and extracting from the sources, you come up with something new, but yet uh, uh, new and original, but yet within the requirements of the tradition. Now, Professor Atas has done the same with education. And this originality, this creativity is warranted. Why? It is warranted because of the challenge of education that we suffer today. Now, have we no similar stories in the past? Well, when we look at the, the confrontation between Islam and, and, and the Western intellectual tradition, to be sure, yes, uh, or to be, uh, to be clear, uh, Imam al-Ghazali and the, and the Sunni intellectual tradition did have to contend with Greek thought in the past. But these Greek thought in the past first were translated and commissioned by Muslim caliphs. And further, after having been translated, they were studied by Muslim scholars and philosophers, most of whom have began, be, began their studies in the madrasa or in the madrasa curriculum. And then further, it was a matter of, of uh, clarification and Islamization and harmonization of concepts that can be harmonized and discarding of concepts that ought to be discarded. But um, it, was, it is something alien to Muslims that you would adopt uh, 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 an alien curriculum together with an alien pedagogy together with um, an alien educational system and process. That, that was something unthinkable. And as late as, let us say, the 20th century, within the Ba'alawi tradition, we read something like uh, the Tadkir al-Mustafa of Habib Abu Bakr Attas al-Habshi, in which he, he mentions there that, that 
uh, that the that he he strongly strongly implores yeah, strongly implores his fellow brethren uh, not to send their children yes to these schools of, of of the french and the british because because it was something uh, so alien it was it would affect him seriously that that, that he, he 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 saw the, the, the ultimate consequences now on the other hand in for most of the muslim world this this westernized system of education has become the the general rule of the day so that what 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 we ought to do in an, uh, just as for example uh, professor atas has given this analogy in um, uh, in his in the risala unto kaum muslimin where he mentions that the the presence of false ideas in the marketplace of of, of thought is akin to the presence of false currency in the uh, in the economic sphere uh, you the the government or the the rightful uh, the rightful printers of knowledge will have to come up with the means to distinguish between the right and the false currency the false and the pseudo currency so now the rightful heirs the rightful prophetic heirs of educational content must come up with the means to distinguish between the proper islamic educational process and content than that which is not so that is why uh, there is uh, there is a need that is a now uh, now clearly established yes for creative thinking and clarification of the basic concepts pertaining to knowledge and education since the major problems derive from these two anyways now the formulation of these key concepts and the way they are brought together in meaningful pattern both in the paper paper and in this book are perhaps the first formulation and conceptualization of its kind found in the context of Muslim intellectual and religious thinking of our times. Yes, and perhaps I mean that there, there, there is work to be done here, but um, it's 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 a good candidate certainly. Yes. Um, so, uh, in summary, yes, what are some of the new ideas that he put forth? First and foremost, yes, the purpose of seeking knowledge and of education in Islam is to produce a good man and, and a good citizen. For us who have now heard this perhaps a, a number of times, it, it becomes uh, natural. Uh, but for many people, for many people, this was not something as um, as as common knowledge as 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 we now think. Yes, um, there is a distinction between producing a good man and a good citizen. A good man will certainly be a good citizen, but a good citizen is not necessarily a good man. A good citizen is an instrument of the of of the state and its educational process and system. Meaning to say that the educational system that produces a good citizen will maximize the marketability of the citizen, or his suitability to fulfill yes, the requirements of the state. In other words, this may include um, managerial abilities. This may include, uh, let us say, uh, productivity and efficiency, marketability all these uh, these terms that pertain to the marketplace and pertains to the requirements of the physical development of the nation state uh, but such a person need not necessarily be uh, an ethical person he need not necessarily i mean the, the the process does not necessarily induce good behavior does not necessarily induce the state of ihsan and god consciousness it does not necessarily produce let us say the virtues of temperance courage wisdom and justice uh, because that's that's not its aim yes now secondly it is the meaning of the concept of good in the definition of good man uh, the term good yes has um, has in recent time be, be, uh, become a focus in the in the departments of philosophy amongst the ethicists but primarily due to the primarily due to the revival of virtue ethics and amongst the philosophers who have popularized the the idea of virtue ethics is um, um, John, uh, McIntyre, yes, who wrote in his book uh, "After Virtue: A Defense of, of Virtue uh, uh, Virtue Ethics." After perhaps more than a hundred years of ethics being taken over and being held hostage to the utilitarians and to the philosophers of language uh, and emotivism and the various other false theses. So uh, McIntyre wrote in 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 or after virtue, uh, uh, basically an effort of trying to bring back virtue as as the purpose of of um, ethics and and ethical training. Um, but uh, since Aristotelian times, this word "good" yes in man is sometimes misunderstood because um, when applied to other things, yes, let us say to be a good cat, 
and to be a good knife yes we mean proper function usually yes usually we mean proper function let us say a good knife is is good for cutting and a good cat is good for petting let us say but a good man is not necessarily good for cutting or for petting isn't it a good man must 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 uh, i mean goodness in a person must be uh, must be explained properly as to the, the the true nature and function of man in existence and this can only be known by a revelation yes the concept of the islamic university as reflecting man yeah need the universal or perfect man and not the state which is not to be confused with what many muslims today think of as an islamic university so remember, now professor atas wrote this, wrote this in 1980 when there are not as many islamic universities and colleges as we begin to see today uh, and perhaps in 1980s when islamic banking and islamic finance is is not to the level that we have now seen today but even then yes even then there are uh, there are uh, there are already attempts at making uh, or dressing universities uh, as islamic universities but not fulfilling the proper requirement of what it is to be an islamic university in the analogous case as we now describe in in the financial law in the banking sector and so on uh, why he says that is because properly an islamic university must be reflecting the universal of perfect man yani the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam which university does that today yes which university offers in terms of curriculum co- curricular content as well as uh, spiritual training as well as intellectual development the liberating of one's spiritual potentials to become more and more akin to the universal man al mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam and and his daughter zahra yes uh, which university does that yes so therefore in order to be properly islamic yes you have to be able to uh, to contemplate yes on the contents of this this curriculum and and the process what it involves the prophetic pedagogy and so on and so forth now in this little book i present some other new ideas yes he adds yes the concept of methodology of scientific research and study of nature along the lines of quranic interpretation tafsir and ta'wil this is truly a brilliant idea uh, that uh, that philosophy of science should be grounded in tafsir and ta'wil we know that the uh, that the great scholars of the tradition especially yes uh, imam uh, imam ar-razi fakhruddin ar-razi have paved the way to excellent work in in tafsir and ta'wil to such an extent that it produced you know the likes of the uh, tafsir uh, the al-kabir or the mafatihul ghaib of imam ar-razi in which he was able to incorporate the best results of human learning and we, when we say human universal human learning that he is able to incorporate within the wonderful science of tafsir that produce multi volume works that addresses multiple subject matter including but not limited to cosmology metaphysics psychology um the linguistic sciences and so on imam, imam al-razi was able to do that and it was one of his later projects because uh, it was once he turned himself to tafsir that became his chief preoccupation and that after having done work uh, significant work in various other disciplines so now professor atas uh, is saying that we ought to um we ought to ground scientific research study of nature and various other disciplines within tafsir and ta'wil with its canon of of methodology and it's uh, certainly a a powerful uh, research program if only muslims adhere to this we could we could be updating uh some of the things that has been said and we could be expanding on some of the things which have been said which we could be correcting on some of the things which have been said where it deserves correction and it would lead to proper growth within the adabic conceptual structure the concept of islamic language the role of the holy quran in the islamization of the languages of the muslim peoples including the arabic language finally that education and educational process in the islamic sense is in reality defined by the concept of ta'dib and not by tarbiyah so you see then that despite being uh, small in size yes only around less than 50 pages of writing professor atas has here the blueprint that could potentially save the the muslim nations that could uh, that could revolutionize the way we understand knowledge education scientific research and various other things uh, wallahu a'lam
All right, over to you, Mr. Host. There's a lot of time. Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, there was uh, extensive elaboration uh, tonight, and actually, I have a question that you finally repeated uh, about uh, say, a good man versus good citizen. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, it might be new to a lot of people, and there was uh, quite an improved understanding to, to me as well. So thank you very much uh, for that. And as, as you said, this book, even though it is less than 50 pages, it has uh, provided uh, a very uh, strong fundamental, in, uh, especially for all of us, the Muslim, in order for us to maybe fix the concept of our, or have better understanding of the concept of religion. Inshallah. So the brothers and sisters, if you have any question, it's already about uh, 9, 15 over here in, in Malaysia. Uh, if you have any question, you may ask, or if you don't, perhaps uh, you can uh, send us uh, a drop the question on our Facebook uh, page, and we shall try to answer them later, inshallah, maybe in the next sessions to come. All right, so if you don't need, then uh, maybe we, we are going to wrap this session with us. Okay. Okay, all right. So thank you very much again for all of you uh, who, who joins and also for Ustaz uh, for, for this session tonight. Inshallah, we are going to meet all of us again uh, in next Monday, same time. We like to with Gaya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right, then. Thank you.